most people, they critique like they care, but they don't. We lack levels of problem solving skills that are needed to reconstruct. They had a passion to go beyond just standing on the sideline. If you're going to tear something down, in the other hand, you need to be building something. Welcome back to another episode of the New Rules Podcast. It's your girl, Breezy, and I am here with Mr. Adrian Crawford. How are you doing today? I'm doing well. How are you? I'm good. Very nice. So today, you mentioned that you want to talk about um, the future belongs to creators, not critics. So what's the genesis of this topic? Uh, really, the genesis of it is that I have just noticed a lot of times just looking on Social media, looking at the current environment that we actually live in today is that there it's very easy um, to critique. And I think that um, a lot of people are critiquing things, but I feel like we have lost the ability to be creators, people actually solving problems and and for real things. I think there's nothing wrong with critiquing something. But again, where does the creation happen? It's it's fine to break something and tear something down, but you should never break anything down without building it up. So I just think that moving forward, I think that if you actually want to make an impact as a leader, as a human being, I think it's very important for you to start thinking about how do I create in whatever space and place you inhabit. How do you think we got to a state of more consistently being critics? I think it's. I think we've always been this way. I just think it's way more heightened now because of the rise of. Uh, I think it's more heightened because we have more access to it. I also think it's heightened even more now. It's because as you know, social commentator Mark Sayer says. I think we went from an age of production to when I was kind of growing up until like maybe the mid 2000s to 2000, well, probably about 2010, 15, we were in the age of consumption where we made and had all these great things. Then we started consuming things. And now I think we're in the age of exploitation where it's the fact of where, you know, when you get in the age of consumption and you're like, you're not really working towards stuff. You just begin to critique more and more and more in the age of exploitation. Now it's just being revealed. I mean, all the stuff that we thought was going to bring us, um, happiness, things we thought were going to bring us liberation, things we thought were going to lead to certain levels of freedom, whatever aren't doing that. So now we're kind of stuck in a place. And I think now what you tend to do is that either you tend to fight through it and find ways to create, or you just start to critique things. What are some examples of things we thought were going to bring us freedom? Um, I think the whole political ideologies that we live in, I think that we felt like the a progressive, uh, left movement was going to, you know, give us more freedom, people having more freedom over their bodies, more, uh, you know, if we were able to get more health care, things like that, then they would move forward on the right. It was, man, you know, don't touch my money, don't touch my guns. And, you know, let's tighten our borders up and all this. And if we do this and we get our right people in office, this is going to happen. But you see, we've had, you know, you think about the 2000s, if I'm not mistaken, we've had a Republican, like an all Republican, I know during George Bush, an all Republican House, um, Senate, and as a president. And there were certain things that they didn't get done. Same thing on the Democratic side. So I think that everyone thought this political ideology was going to float us to a utopia. Because most of the times when people are really hype on their political ideology, they're talking about a world that exists. And a lot of times that's world is like, Things are better, but they're carefree with some of their problems. And so I think what we ended up doing was thinking that was going to help us. But really what we're seeing now is a greater divide. What we're seeing is now is both political parties are actually flawed. And it didn't lead to our, you know, our floating to utopia. So I think that's another big one. I think another big one is the idea of like just um, of access to more uh, opportunity and money, for example. I mean, you know, we have we have lived and we're living a time where there's more access and opportunity for people. I mean, you think about this. I mean, I never thought about growing up that someone could actually be a video gamer. Right. And actually make you know, actually make a living or just sit behind a camera, you know, like, you know, I always joke, somebody sitting literally behind a camera watching somebody play video games, and, you know, you're watching and you can make a bunch of money. I mean, there's so much access to opportunity, but yet and still it hasn't panned out the way we thought it was because ultimately money does not give you when you start to lack things that are happening inside internally. So those are a couple of different things that are top of my head that I feel like are, are things that we thought were going to give us what we hoped for that it didn't. How would you describe the difference between a creator and a critic? I think a creator is a critic. I actually think a creator is a critic, but they're but the thing they do, they critique things they want to change. 
Um, I always tell people, don't judge a tree. You know, the whole thing, you know, it's the whole Bible thing. Don't judge a tree, you know, judge a tree by its fruit, right? Mm -hmm. Well, I say, sure, do that. But don't judge a tree unless you're willing to take care of the fruit, unless you're willing to take care of that tree. I think that actually a creator is someone who's willing to see where there is maybe a flawed design, see where there's a problem, and they're willing to put their talent, their resources, um, their intellect on the line in order to try to see whatever that problem is solved or part of that problem solved. I think they have a they have a, a real desire to add value. And I think a critic is just somebody who they see there's something wrong. They know we should have change, but they're actually not willing to do anything to actually do that. Because the thing about a critic, you can just critique things and then just walk away. You don't ever have to make anything. You know what I mean? People may have an opinion about your critique, but that's about it. You're not really on the line for anything versus if you're like, oh, no, I critique something, but I'm going to go create. Now your creation now is going to face critique. And I think a lot is just so much easier for people to do that. I think, again, a creator, someone who's willing to put their resource there. I think a critic is just someone who sits on the sideline, looks at something, calls out. I always say this. They call files. You know, they see what's wrong. They can tell you everything's wrong. They probably can even tell you why it's wrong, but they're not willing to do anything to try to fix it. So if creating starts from a place of dissatisfaction, what are the qualities that move somebody to action? I think it's a desire and a care. I think another thing is that we, we rage about everything today. Um, And because we're connected, we're supposed to care about everything, but we care about nothing. Because you have access to everything. You know what I mean? So if we see like wildfires that happen in Australia, then we see a uh, war that's happening in Russia and Ukraine. Man, then maybe, you know, we see a tsunami that happens, you know, in another country. Then we see, you know, an earthquake happen here. And these things all can just say these things happen all within, you know, a couple of weeks. Man, you go from one thing to the next thing to the next thing. And so we're all supposed to care because we have instant access to what's actually happening. And so what we'll do is care so much about these things. And then what will happen, we'll, we'll care, we'll think about it, and then we'll just kind of like move on. But it never moves us to action. I think what you begin to see is when you see something that just really bothers you, that it bothers you so much that you're not okay with seeing it anymore. You know what I mean? Like, you know, you think about change, Rosa Parks, there was something she didn't want to see anymore. Um, I mean, you can go in again, like, I mean, from inventors, they saw something, they didn't want to see it anymore. They had a passion to go beyond just standing on the sideline. And I think most people, they critique like they care, but they don't. You know, uh, that's a lot of our world today. We critique like we care, but we don't create. I know that you care when you start to create. And so I think that's kind of the, how we've gotten there. You gave the example of Rosa Parks. Do you think that what the problem that you decide to make steps towards solving has to be something that directly impacts you? Hmm, that's a great question. I don't think it has to by any means. Um, but I, but I do think that that does, um, that is, is a thing that can give you an incentive. So I don't think it has to be, I think there could be something that does not directly impact you. You know, when you look at mother Teresa, um, you know, and what she did with, you know, with orphans and, and really street kids in Calcutta, like she was a nun. This didn't affect her like day to day life, but there was something that invoked her the willingness to not just sit there and just say, man, look at all these poor kids that are here, but I'm actually willing to move. I'm actually willing to take whatever I have in my hand and it started off with just these broken pencils to start helping kids learn and to, and to help clothe them on and on. And she was willing to do it. So I, she's an example where it doesn't have to directly affect you, but I do think that can be a thing that actually motivates you. Would you maybe tie it to a deeper why? Like the, a deeper why can create common ground, even if you haven't been through that exact thing. Yeah, absolutely. Like, I mean, like I have a deep desire right now. Like my deep why in life is this idea of authenticity. And but I'm realizing, you know, as I look around and start to study, we're living in the the largest or the biggest, you know, kind of leadership shortage that we've ever had in our country. You know, statistically, it shows that um, actually people's belief, you know, I mean, before I remember it may have been like in the 70s or 80s, maybe in the 90s. Like, I think like approval of like like government officials was like in the 70s. Now it's, it's like it was high 70s. Now it's dropped to the 40s. Uh, maybe even lower than that. And so people don't trust. I mean, not trusting CEOs on and on. I say all that to say 
the desire for authenticity is a deeper why. Living in a leadership gap, the desire to launch authentic leaders, this whole thing of I really want to see authentic leaders launch into the world does not directly affect me in my everyday life. Um, it's not that if, uh, if authentic leaders don't write, don't, we don't create authentic leaders that my life is going to be, you know, drastically immediately affected. But I do think that there's going to be an effect in our country, an effect on human flourishing. If we don't start seeing real authentic leaders raised up. So that is something that's invoking me to actually go beyond just myself, but it does come from my why. What, what role does deconstruction play? Um, I think deconstruction is incredibly important. See, we've lived in a time to where everyone has, um, you know, we go to extremes, right? We talk about this anxiety drives black and white thinking. So what was happening, especially let's say 2016, 2020, um, there's a lot of deconstruction happening across, you know what I mean? Whether if it was in the Me Too movement, you know, you start seeing man, certain just kind of, you know, structures that were put in place that were hindering women, actually creating spaces for women to not be safe. Um, and that, and I think everyone can say, oh, some of that stuff that was revealed in the deconstruction of certain practices, a hundred percent, that was really good. I think the idea of talking about, you know, police reform, some of the things that happened with black lives matter. Um, those were things where people were, I think deconstruction to start talking about it. I mean, you think about like civil rights, it was a deconstruction. So deconstruction has its place. The problem is I think what began to happen, there was a real thing. And then people begin to just jump on the bandwagon. Like that was always my frustration with 2020 is because like, you know, I think it was Bill Burr said like, you know, the comedian was like, you know, like black lives matter was about black people for about like 20 seconds to progressive white women stepped in and said, you know, it is about us too. Like, like what in the world? And it's like, but what he was saying was, is a true thing is that I think people jumped on the bandwagon and they started deconstructing to just, it was anarchy. They wanted to tear down. It wasn't to help. It was just to tear down. And I think that's when deconstruction goes wrong is that if you're going to tear something down, then I think in the other hand, you need to be building something. We don't tear down to not build something up. Who are some creators and critics that we see? Creators and critics. Wow. Oh, that's an interesting question. Um, it's funny. I think Elon is a creator and a critic. I think that the, you know, I don't you know, know him at all, but what I can see from the outside and this is where a lot of people go is that, I mean, you cannot deny what he's created. You know, I mean, he's added value. I mean, no one was talking about EV cars before. No one was, I mean, the fact of, you know, getting access to people, um, when you start talking about from, um, up in space, from, uh, from internet to, you know, all the stuff he does with, uh, I think it's Starlink, if I'm not mistaken. And then, you know, what he did also with PayPal, we all bank online now, a lot of stuff he's jumped in, he created a lot. Mm -hmm. But I think what happened was that guys like that who create a lot, end up believing they are masters at everything. So now he jumps into the media space like Twitter and now what's happened, he's now become a critic um, more than a creator. And I think that he's a prime example where I think he has become way more of a critic of culture. You know, he spends so much time on Twitter talking about woke ideology and blah, 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 um, talking about the progressive left, all these things that he has issues with and not creating. He was really doing stuff when he was creating. So he's one who went from a creator to like actually being like a critic. Um, I think, I don't know, just open up like any social media app and you could just pick. I mean, you probably, everybody, I mean, I've got like probably 10 friends. I'm like, oh no, they're critics, right? <laughs> um, as far as another creator, I think that uh, somebody who, I think Earl McManus is someone who's a creator. Um, I'm trying to think who else is out there. Uh, I mean, those are just two top people off the top of my head. There's a t I mean, there's a lot of other people who are creating, I think, you know, what they're doing with Chad GPT, Sam Altman. Um, I think that there is a lot of people who are actually, you know, in politics today who are at lower levels, maybe state government, state houses who are trying to create. Um, I think there are people doing nonprofits who are trying to create. I think there's small businesses that are trying to be creators instead of just talking about it. You know, I love to hear stories of, of people who actually go into the world and, and instead of talking about, man, we don't have any jobs in the city, they go create jobs. Mm -hmm. And so I think there's people like that. Yeah. And it also seems as though like we can name a few creators, but there are very many that are overlooked and undervalued. Absolutely. Yeah. Very sure. Yeah. Because it's not, if you're not, you know, I use Elon cause everybody would know that, but there are people in everyday life, you know, somebody who is a part of our group, JT Escobar, 
like JT is a creator. You know, we started Equal Shot, you know, we started Equal Shot Academy, we started Equal Shot together um, and kind of jumping. And then JT has taken it. But JT's whole thing is that his whole thing is that he wants all kids, you know, especially kids of color to actually see value in themselves. He wants to give them access. So instead of him just talking about it as somebody who came, uh, you know, even though he has the last name Escobar, you know, if you see JT is white, white. <laughs> right. And so there, and so, um, but when you see JT, like he even says it all the time, he was like, man, and JT's one of the, I used to train JT, one of the hardest workers I've ever been around. But JT will tell you, he's like, I started on second or third base. He's like, I still had to work really hard, but I was way ahead of people. And so he's somebody very practically that's literally stepping in, building a business, but the business is also on this other side of the academy of what we're doing, giving people access, um, giving kids access. You know what I mean? Somebody like a Derek Hayes who's in our group, who's actually uh, you know in Apalachicola, Florida right now, and we have something we started an academy that we're doing there, um, where all kids where we don't, we talk about being you know raising up leaders. He's going to be in all the he's going to be in the middle school raising up middle school you know leaders, authentic leaders that are happening. He's someone giving his life in order to go do that. I mean, I give two people that we know just right here, but there are there. There are thousands and thousands of people in our country who are doing that every single day. But right now, the loudest voice are those who just get there and they just critique. And then they, sometimes it's not even just how big your platform is. Sometimes it's just a constant thing. I mean, I literally, I very rarely read comment sections on something controversial. And even today, I, my friend posted a picture of LeBron James, you know, with, um, uh, on the, like the Olympic boat, right? Which, by the way, is an <laughs> epic picture because I was like, so I mean, funny. the memes are my, like, the flag was over there just holding it, like, you know, <laughs> then he looked like Captain America, looked like he was going to take us into battle. But, but people, I mean, he posted this picture and he literally just wrote it. Now he was trying to call something, but he was like, let me leave this here. So for all y'all who are mad out there and do the comments, people were just jumping in, like just going wild talking about, you know, I can't believe that they let him hold the flag. He knelt down during 2020. He only cares about himself. And I'm like, and I'm listening to him. I'm like, okay, like maybe, maybe LeBron only thinks about himself, but like, his image matters to him. I mean, there's some things I could say, but like, I want to say this though, the dude created a school where kids have the opportunity that black and brown kids have opportunities to where if they graduate from the school, just basic requirements, he pays for them to go to college. If their parents have not got their, uh, their GED or graduate high school, he pays for them to get their GED. Like, the dude, everybody talks about him. I'm like, he should be like, and again, I'm just not political. He should be like the Republican Party's poster child. A kid who came from nothing, used his skills and talents to become one of the best, and now is using that to uplift another, uplift the community. It's like, it's the American story, but because he stood out against justice. And again, I'm not saying I agree with everything LeBron does, but what I am trying to say is like, people are critiquing LeBron James. And I'm like, LeBron James has done way more for human life than most people who critique him. Cause they, cause I'm looking at this thing and they're just critiquing about the flag and I can't believe he was holding the flag. They shouldn't let him do that. And I just stay off of comments because what I did, I literally read that I was in there for like two minutes and I found myself getting so angry and frustrated because inside I'm like, don't you guys have jobs? Don't you have kids? Don't you have something to do? Then be online arguing with people about a grown man holding a flag to represent the country. It's insanity, but like we just live there now. I know whenever you started to tell that story, I was like, I can't even remember what LeBron did or didn't do during 2020 when everything was going around. So it, yeah. it's ironic. Um, it's probably a sign that you are more of a critic if you have the time. Yeah, and I get it because there's times where LeBron, which I would I which I disagreed with. There's times where LeBron, like he would when some of the 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 shootings and things were happening. He was very emotional because it, you know, again, like I was very emotional and he would take right to social media and write some stuff down. Right. But like LeBron's like, but the problem is that LeBron's Instagram following is bigger than most countries. It's like, I think he has more followers than Barack Obama. Like, yeah, like, dude, you send a, you send a, you post something on your story or on your timeline man, or, 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 you know, you're on Twitter or whatever, people are going to, like, that's going to impact people. So I think people saw that. And so I think he made mistakes there. But as far as, like, yeah, but going back into it, I'm like, there were so many different people who, you know, who did that. But it's just he's an easy target, and I get it. So, 
Well, it almost seems like um, part of the role of of a creator is to listen to the voices of the critics. Yes. But there's a massive tension there. Can you talk a little bit more about that? Yeah, the late, great Billy Graham once said, let your critics be your greatest coaches. Um, and, and I think that's incredible wisdom. I think that actually creators should listen, well, if it's your own personal critique towards you, but also critique toward other things because I think they're looking, I think everybody can point to the problem. I thought, I'm sorry to say everybody, a lot of people can point to the problem on the surface, but what they can't do is actually get underneath the surface and then have the ability to bring a solution to actually fix that. So again, I think a lot of times when you're hearing people talk, you're hearing people cry out for certain things. The question, can we actually do it? I mean, you think about it today, everybody's like, man, we just need to come together with unity, right? And then like the same people, this is the, and this is where I think the, the absolute hypocrisy of our government officials because they will say in one breath, man, we need to come together. And then in the next breath, two minutes later, they're critiquing or they're taking their point. You know what I'm saying? They, they, they won't, you know, like they won't mourn the loss of someone within three minutes. They're talking about gun control. You know what I'm saying? Or when somebody, you know, like when something else happens, it's like, you know, or somebody gets shot. It's, oh, you know, they should have been compliant. I mean, it's all the stuff where it's like, can we just stop and mourn the loss of a life? Like, where have we gone? And I think people want unity, but they're not willing to do the hard work of unity because to do the hard work of unity means you actually have to get better internally. A lot of these people who say this stuff are just internally, they're not very tough. They don't have a lot of resilience because again, to have resilience is one of the greatest signs of people who I think are really tough and resilient are those who are willing to be reconcilers. They're willing to, they have friends who don't, they don't agree with, they work with people and they're on projects with people they don't agree with, but they're willing to find a common goal that they're going after. And so I think we just have gotten to this place now to where, you, you listen, and so you hear everybody saying this, and so my whole thing is like, how do we actually step in to actually begin to help and fix that? Something that you say frequently and that you also said while we were recording just now is to not judge someone else's fruit if you're not willing to tend to the tree. Mm-hmm. Um, so nuance question that, that I've considered before is uh, what's the tension of like, okay, I know what I'm responsible for and my skill set and like the ground that I'm fighting to cover. Yeah. Yeah. And I'm looking to my right and I'm like, you're not covering the ground that you're supposed to cover, yep. but I'm also not supposed to tend to that problem. Yep, yep, yep. There does seem like an appropriate like level of criticism mm-hmm. that is provided and like, Hey, like you're the person to solve this problem and you're not doing everything that you can with yep. what you have to solve it. Yeah. And there should be a call out to an extent. When do you know that that is distracting you Mm -hmm. from what you are creating? I think it distracts you when... Or when it's unkind to even communicate to the... Well, I think one of the things I think we need to get back to a little bit is that, you know, one... I mean, I think there's public things, right? I mean, like we have government officials who represent us. I mean, an obvious thing. So I can say something about a government official because right now... Like, I, I don't say, like, oh, this person directly this, and not unless it has a direct impact. But when I talk about this, we all are, no one's dumb. Like, our political, you know, our political leaders right now just divide everybody. So I think that's a very clear thing. Now, when you look across, like you said, somebody next to you, I think it gets out of, uh, you know, it can be unkind or get out of balance is when you're more obsessing about it and you're more mad at that person. I can't believe you, you know what I mean? Versus being able to say, no, like this is a problem. Why are you not helping fix the problem? You're more frustrated with the problem than actually the person. And I think if you have a relation, I think if you said, was a good time to talk to someone? I mean, do you have a relationship with that person? I think if you have a relationship with that person, then it's okay. I think to, Hey, say this, communicate it, critique it. But a lot of times we critique things about stuff. I mean, like the church world is the, uh, is like one of the top worst places of this. Like, you know, there's a, there's a, very you know kind of famous instagram communicator right now michael todd and like i said i don't know him Uh, again this is not my endorsement of of whatever from about michael todd but what i know is like the level of how much people talk about this dude and what he's doing what he's not doing what his things are let's let's talk about this he wore this he did this done this and the thing i want to ask him is like okay that's true critique it that's fine but then i want to look at what are you doing how many people have come to faith because of your life 
Because that's the one thing I want to do. I don't want to talk about something if I'm not actually in the trenches living it, trying to make a change. I'm not saying it has to be at the same level, but I'm actually doing things. But a lot of times, most people who are the, your, the hardest critics are those who I, that I've come to know do the least amount of work and make the least amount of impact. So how much time should we spend considering what somebody does or doesn't do with their power or influence? That's a great question. I, honestly, if it's not out of the why or on the way of your mission, I don't think you spend that much time. I mean, I have really, I'll just say this personally. I have worked really hard over the last couple years to really stop being engaged and involved with things that don't have direct impact on me. Um, an example is that, but there are certain things that do, that may happen at a national scale. I lead a very diverse church. So when racial things happen that cause tension, I have to address it, critique it, but I never do that without giving solution because of all the different people that are represented uh, from the people that we actually lead. Um, and, and so I have to you know go into there and I have to be willing to, to do that. But I think a lot of times if it's not pushing towards your mission or impacting you directly, I think we just spend way too much time worrying about that stuff. Um, and expect, and again, and I'm going to say this, it's okay that if you like, man, if it's, if you have one of your good friends and you're like, man, you just, you know, man, this really bothered me. You just want to get it off your chest. Talk to one of your good friends. But I think when everyone goes to social, you know, like, um, you know, like the other day, you know, the, the horrible killing of, and I literally it was a murder of like Sonia Massey. And, and it was one of the most horrific things I saw. It was more troubling to me personally than George Floyd. But here's the deal. Then not too long after, I cannot stand going on people's Instagram stories. And then what they begin to talk about, about if you aren't posting anything about her death, if you're not doing this, it tells me what you do. And I'm like, do you know how arrogant that is? Like how arrogant it is for you to tell somebody that I know where you stand if you're not posting something because yes, our posts really change lives. I'm like, what are you talking about? I think we spend way more time worrying about what other people are doing versus saying, no, what am I doing? And I understand people a lot of times have pain. And so they may see a friend who's silent or they know a friend who's got some kind of crazy views. So that's their indirect way of taking a shot at them. I get those types of internal pains or whatever. But man, like I just have tried really hard to stop doing that because it doesn't do anything. On social media, I've tried my best to say, how do I add value and how do I bring something different in there versus the same old same? You know, there's moments where things I feel like I need to speak to because I feel like I have authority to speak to it. When you talk about building diversity, 100%, I have the authority to speak about that because I've done that. When it talks about authenticity, I feel like I have the authority to actually talk about that. When it comes to like certain matters, I have, you know, like basketball, I have authority I feel like to talk about. So things I feel like I have an expertise in, I will talk about. But other stuff, man, I just learn to keep my mouth quiet like um yeah so how do you um navigate like we we just referenced the recent murder and then something like that happens and there is a an significant increase in the amount of discourse and criticism towards an existing system Mm -hmm. and there are components of that that are true and relevant to be discussed yep and there are components of that that uh, are getting to the negative aspects of criticism. So can you explain a little bit more of the nuances and the extremes Mm -hmm. within those two areas? Yeah, I I think it is okay to critique. So I'll give you an example. When that situation happened, I called a friend of mine who is, um, who's a former investigator uh, for the state of Florida, uh, pro police whole deal. Um, and, but what I do is that I called him, even though I saw what I saw, but I'm like, let me call him because again, he's someone who like, man, there's certain protocols. I mean, I'd agree with the protocols that certain policing things, but if, you know, but it's like, it doesn't justify, but if somebody was trained a certain way, okay, that gives me better insight, whatever. I mean, I called him and then within two minutes, you know, he takes like a day, he'll look at it, read stuff. He calls me back in two minutes. He's like, oh yeah, that was flat out murder. And this is a guy's whatever. My point is that I think at times, like if you're trying to get information in discourse, but when you start getting to a place to where now you are starting to really like that anger, you know what I mean? Like that real rage toward people on the other side, that's when critiquing goes wrong. 
critiquing, you should critique something that you want to see fixed and you should critique it because you now we should bring it to awareness. I think there are some things in 2020 that man brought awareness uh, to our world. And I think it was important to see that what brought awareness was that for a long time, black people had been saying this is at times how we're treated uh, by police. And, and I think that became when people saw George Floyd murdered right in front of them. Oh, it now became right there. They were able to see it. I think being able to see that critique certain things with policing, whatever. But when you start to go to these extremes, I just think it just starts to get, you know, when you start going to anger and rage, I think that's when it gets out of balance. Any thoughts, questions? Oh, you guys are good, but like, don't stop because you're good. And then the other day, when Kamala Harris uh, announced that she was running for um, presidency, mm -hmm. and there was so much backlash, like everybody hated Joe Biden, but they also hated Kamala Harris. And I was thinking about maybe I read this, maybe I thought of this, I don't remember. But somebody was saying like, don't let perfect be the enemy of good. Mm -hmm. And like, how I feel like don't let good be the enemy of great is a good critique for someone who's a fixator and then a good critique for someone who is a critic is don't let perfect be the enemy of good how would you i don't have a question like what are your thoughts on like on how that find the middle i guess and hmm. i think it's always about yeah I, again it goes back to why are you critiquing and I think because we don't deal a lot with our emotional state, because like when I saw Sonia Massey get shot, I was like, what about that? Like what was going on in me? It's like, yes, it was watching a person lose their life, watching a single mom lose her life, watching her call the police to come protect her and she loses her life. The injustice, the, the seeing injustice bothered me. So I had to deal with that. I also had to deal with the fact of like fear. You know, I have three children. I have three black children. I don't care what, and this is not hyper. I, I hate when people do this. Like they think, oh, well, you know, when, when black people say, well, man, like that, I have, I have worry about that. And what people will do at times, and they try to like downplay your worry. Oh, you're just hyper wise. You're just catch, caught up in a moment. I'm like, no, it's not. I have a son who was born on the spectrum. I mean, as a young black man, we used to have to constantly tell him why you have, as he was learning through, why you have to be, you have to be, you have to listen and be compliant because one day it could cost you something like that's a real conversation. My point of why I say that is that there was real fear in me. So I had to deal with that because see, when you have fear, you have all this other stuff, then what you'll do is just rage. I think one of the ways that you find balance is you have to see when a moment happens, when you're critiquing, why, why are you really critiquing this? Is it a lot of times I think it's just undealt with emotions inside of people that then they just have to get, you know, so like emotions go somewhere. So now they go online or they go whatever and they rage. Oh, whoops. There we go. I got really excited. They go and they rage against something versus doing that. So I think one of the best ways that you actually become a really good, a good, good creative critic is dealing with what is actually happening inside of you. Because I think if people did that, we wouldn't have as much discourse and stuff online right now. And people critiquing in our nation being the way it is if actually people dealt with how they were really internally doing. I feel like some of the criticism is fueled by believing that everything is our problem and great, the belief yeah. that everything's our problem almost keeps us very stagnant mm. every day yep. and then making no progress in one singular problem because we're so spread spread thin across many. Yeah. Yeah. No, you're absolutely right. I th again, it goes back to the whole thing is that we're everywhere, but we're nowhere. It's that we think every issue is our issue. And then what's, if it's not someone else's issue. If their issue isn't my, if the, your issue isn't my issue, then I start to critique your issue. You know, I mean, like, how many times do we see someone who, like, you know, I mean, how, we see, oh man, if this is the most important thing. If you don't care about this, and I'm like, dude, I'm like, there's only so much I can care about. Like, there's only so much time I can put towards something, and so I have to make that decision. And what you have to trust is for people to be functioning adults to say, no, this matters to me. Here's why this matters to me. Here's what I'm, gonna, you know, I'm doing. Like a great example, being in a church space. This is what happens. I believe in the sanctity of life, and and I and and again, I really do. And I think there are some incredible organizations out there that are really trying to help women. Uh, through that process and whatever. And I'm just not going to, I'm not making a blanket statement about this, but like, 
But here's the deal. In a church space, if you don't say that, man, this is the number one issue that's going, but you also talk about, oh, what about the, the, the conditions of black and brown people who are outside of the womb? like those who are fatherless, because here's what they'll say. Well, you know, because then the other side will say, well, you know, if there's fathers in the home, things will be better. You're like, listen, when I read the Bible, the Bible tells you to take care of the widow, the orphan, and those, the widow and the orphan. It does not tell you, well, if they, if their father was killed in, on, you know, on, you know, in war, then you take care of the orphan. It says, no, you take care of the orphan. You take care of the widows. You take care of those who like don't have fathers. That's what, that's the job of what a Jesus follower should be. And what we will do is then we'll say people will critique saying, well, your issue isn't that. And then they'll start ranking them. And I'm like, dude, it's just some of this stuff. I think it's just it's becoming just so much like what you're saying. It's like you're everywhere. You're nowhere. I think I would ask you this question because being in Gen Z and these things are very much so stuff you guys care about. Like there's issues that you care about. But what I've seen and you can correct me in this is that there's a care of there's a lot of deconstruction but not a lot of people trying to build. And maybe I'm not seeing it correctly. So I would add, what's your kind of take on your generation when it comes to this whole thing? What do you think? By the way, everybody, this is Lauren, our producer, who's on there. So long. <laughs> if you're listening on a podcast, people are like, who's this random voice? Is this the, you know, is this the voice of God? <laughs> and that would cause a lot of issues. <laughs> is God a female? Oh, my God. I knew it. No. All right. Keep going. so many people my age, even friends I had who were Christians growing up who are no longer Christians, we all kind of did the same deconstruction process, and the only difference between my friends who are no longer Christians and myself is that I chose to reconstruct and they didn't, and now my faith looks very different, but I think that can go towards so many different things, like, um, I think another popular thing to deconstruct, I feel like, is people's perception or women young women specifically their perception of men and like oh yeah I'm men and blah, blah, blah. like i've been there too and it wasn't until recently that like i had to reconstruct my view of what maybe not what a man should or shouldn't be like i don't think that's necessarily like for me to decide for everybody mm-hmm. but like at least the way that i interact with yeah. my concept of men mm-hmm. and I feel like you can that towards anything. But regardless, when I think about like my least favorite places to live in my own head were when I had deconstructed but had not yet chose to reconstruct. Mm-hmm. And some of them were like longer stretches. And then it's just like this like little like pile of dirt and you're like, what am I supposed to do with it? Yeah. Nobody wants yeah. to yeah. sit there. But it takes so much time but so much effort to rebuild those things and really wise people around you too which I think specifically with my faith if I didn't have certain people around me like I would have never yeah. reconstructed yeah I think and I want to I want you to answer this but I want to say something because I think that's something that's really important when you talked about something that was needed in a critique of like how men especially in around 2016 how men were really treating women you know the whole me too movement but that's a prime example of like tearing down some structures that needed to be and not building anything. And now the results are that of that is that you have men who are now way more apathetic because anytime, I mean, cause now it's like anytime a man tries to take leadership or do things like that, I shouldn't say every time, but a lot of times it gets like, it gets categorized a certain way. If a guy, you know, we talked about this on the podcast, a guy approaches somebody in the gym and it could be very genuine, nothing, whatever. Right. And, it's everybody has these perspectives about the guy or whatever, but then they want men to be, be more forward. But then when they are forward, then you're a creeper. And then, you know, it's just, it's literally so hard and we didn't build anything. And that goes to a person who I think is a creator, Scott Galloway. Mm-hmm. I think Scott Galloway does a great job of creating because he's seen these needs and he not only talks about it, but he actually goes out there and, you know, he's created resources for it. He's putting money behind things. You know what I mean? I think we saw it the other day. I think he's giving like $10 million. Um, he's giving $10 million for 
um, education, uh, alternative educations through, I think through Cal Berkeley and I think through UCLA where people who have like kind of online kind of like, you know, like the extension schools, he's actually funding those things because he wants to give people, you know, cause only what I think they only allow like 3%, you know, into schools and something like that or 6%. And he was like, man, I, he was like a two point, whatever student. He's like, if I didn't get into UCLA, and I didn't have this. He's like, I would have never turned into what I was able to get, you know? And so I'm watching a guy like him, but he also has a really big thing about men because he's seeing the issue and he's trying to really step in to fix that. And so again, he's somebody who critiques it, the culture, but also is creating at the same time. And so I think that's one, that's a very good point that Lauren made. That that's something we saw in real time that got torn down, you know, and I've got a few others I could talk about, but what do you think? I think that, uh... I, I do agree that there's a lot of deconstruction um, with a lack of reconstruction. And I was thinking about why. I think that's because there's a lack of hope for a future. And when you, when you have a scarcity mindset of time, mm -hmm. your, thoughts, your thoughts only go so far in reconstruction. Mm. Um, from a, like a more corporate standpoint and like social ideas, it's yeah. like, well, that seems like that could pretty quickly fix this problem. So, like, let's pretty quickly get that in place so that this mm. can be fixed. Yep. And but I do think that that's mostly driven by. I don't. I don't think it's an ill intent. Like, I, I think it, it really is a genuine care and concern. Yep. That also has a lot of fear and anxiety mm -hmm. around, like, are we all even going to be here? in 10 years yeah. so we really need to try to fix this fast so that we can all flourish mm. better and yep. quicker but nothing is you know you can tear something down really quickly yes. but it takes a very long time to build it back up absolutely and you know they always say like you know something the bigger the building the deeper the foundations has to go it really is i mean you know right outside of our um right outside of our office building there's a, a structure right across the street and man within like you know, eight hours, that thing's gone. You know what I mean? That thing was there. I mean, they, didn't, I mean, it took them like two days. I mean, it's completely cleared out. I mean, it was, and what's crazy, that was something. What's interesting about that place, it's a former bar. You know how many memories and people, I mean, it was there for like, I mean, 40, 50 years. And then literally less than a day, all of what that was inside thing was torn down. And I think you can tear things down. Like you said, you're a great point. You can tear them down very quick, but we're going to watch them build something over there. And it's about to take the next year, year and a half for them to build something. It's the Florida highways. Yeah, I know. Well, and then living in the city, man, getting like permits is like, you might have a better chance to talk to the president. But anyway, uh, but like I said, that's my critique of, uh, you know, Tallahassee. <laughs> so I can't fix that. So let me not critique Tallahassee, you know, um, <laughs> Tallahassee's permit, you know what I'm saying? How they do their permits. God bless you all who do that. Um, that's not our problem. To that's, solve. Not, that's not my problem to solve at all. <laughs> I agree with Bree. Like, a quick build is often a bad build, but also, like, a solo build is probably not a good build either. Like, yeah, absolutely. Like, yeah, and the hyper individualism. Like, yeah, reconstructing, like, if I'm reconstructing something on my own, then the reconstruction just looks exactly like me. Like, yep. if there's, like, poor beams missing, I use the wrong screws, like, it's just a bad. And, and a lot of what you're going to build and a lot of what you're going to build is going to build something that it's going to keep you away from pain points. And those pain points can be very like you need to build this way and you're going to feel pain, but it's needed. And that's why you need to have other people, because when you because, again, no one just naturally. I know we'll say this, but like. Maybe somebody like, I mean, I've, a lot of people can deal with like physical pain. Like I'm, you know, they're one of the people, you know, everybody goes to CrossFit. I feel like it's that way. Like I just want all the physical pain in the world. But like, I'm telling you, there are very few people in the world that literally want emotional pain. Like it's way more painful. So when you have internal pain like that, a lot of times you won't build, you will build to protect. And a lot of times you could be missing some real things. And so I'll give you a quick example. And then I want you to say, speak to what you're about to was that. Um, you know, we're using the church space, but because we build a diverse world in 2020, what a lot of black Christians woke up to was the fact of people were talking about building a diverse world, but it was more of like, yeah, we want your skin color, but not really you. We were told certain things. I was told certain things of like, of man, did I, that, um, in the name of reconciliation or a diverse world, 
they were asking me to leave parts of kind of in of of of, of a culture that it wasn't like anti the Bible. It was just it was just different. But other people were not allowed, didn't have to do that. And so what happened? It rose up a bunch of people. That, you know, they're leaving black people leaving the multi ethnic church. But the problem that came with that is the fact people were leaving, and I need to wake up to it. But then I'm like, now what? Now what's happened is that people have now either walked away from faith or they've just gone to a place where people are just like you. And what I fought for and what I'm still fighting for is I believe in a multi-ethnic church. I'm not saying it's the only one, but I believe in it. And so much so that I, I'm, you know, what we created with the Black Leadership Summit. I did, I wasn't going to critique and say, okay, well, man, people need to just stop walking away and they need to fight there. I'm like, we're like, no, we've created a space to actually encourage black Christians to build in multi-ethnic ways, but also giving them space to work through that, not just create a space where black people can come together and we can just gripe and complain about our past experiences. Sometimes you need to gripe and complain about your past experience to get healed. So then you can tear down what was there and then build back up. But again, I saw that very clear. And, um, and again, that was one of the reasons why we went out and we created you know, the Black Leadership Summit was to actually not to just critique people leaving. So that's a problem. And I can't believe it. And then blame all these leaders who were creating. We're like, no, let's go try to solve that. Yeah. Some younger people are like, well, this is so obsolete. Like, I don't care. Go ahead. You want to Well, say? I feel like that's a part of being overparented. Yeah, I think Be- it's a, what well, you got. Sorry, I didn't cut you off. Because I think that there is a, there is a component of, of maturity that's built over time and as you face things. Mm. But I also feel like as a generation who, the generation before solved a lot of our problems for us like Mm -hmm. even within the whole even like basic skills and basic problems like those kinds of concepts Mm -hmm. i feel like it creates a place where we lack levels of problem solving skills that are needed to reconstruct Mm -hmm. even at the level that would be appropriate for where we're at right now Mm -hmm. and that creates an even greater chasm yeah and and i think lauren that there's a couple things i think it's very you know it's very complex in this sense i think there were parts of it that it made our generation and the generation above us have to look themselves in the mirror and they didn't want to do that. Because what I always say this, if you bake a cake and then the cake comes out crappy and you blame the cake, that's pretty much what we did. Like we raised you and then we're like, ah, I can't believe they're soft. They suck. I'm like, literally, it wasn't like a child woke up one day. So, you know what? I want participation trophies. It wasn't that because here's the thing. And when people say like, oh, well, you know, this is this progressive left liberal thing. I'm like, dude, you have no idea. I'm around far right wing people who, when their child gets a C because they literally will not do anything in gym class, they cause literal hell and and threaten to pull money that they donate to the school if they don't fix it. That right there is this, and they talk, the same people talk about meritocracy. I'm like, no, it's not. I'm like, at the end of the day, you know, your fears of Sally not going to Duke or whatever it may be, now you're going to step in and do all this crazy stuff about it. And, and I think parents didn't want to have to face that. And I can tell you, that's a hard thing. I mean, as a parent, I see things in my children, I'm like, man, gosh, like there are certain times of things they do. I mean, I, like, I have good kids, but there are things they do sometimes. I'm like, man, like, I don't like how that is. I'm like, what, what could we have done better? You know what I'm saying? I think the second thing of what you were saying, I do think as parents, and or I do think one of the responsibilities, I wouldn't say just parents, for Gen X right now, I really believe Gen X has a responsibility to help guide Gen Z and millennials into light, like to, it, through these things. Like, I feel like there's a, so Andrew Chris, I think we have a responsibility to like come alongside and help. So it's like, man, well, as their reconstruction, but the other part of a reconstructing thing, you've got to see that you need that. It can't be, you know, someone coming and say, Hey, you need this. Listen to me now. No, you have to understand you need wisdom. That's why I think the tension is. I think a lot of times 
it's, it can be very easy just to blame the older generation for the things they created, whatever. And then I can say in this generation, a lot of times it's not the willingness to ask for help. It's not the willingness to say, you know what? I'm wrong. Cause that's what I find hard sometimes with the younger generation is the acceptance of being wrong and then being willing to allow someone to actually help you change and fix to be better. And I get it. I mean, there's a bunch of things, but at some point in time, I tell people when I was trying to figure things out, I used to always just go ask somebody. When I started a business, I didn't know what that was. I didn't know how to do it. So I literally was like, hey, who's successful? What would you do if you were in my shoes? And that's how I learned. But I think you have to have the humility in order to do that. So I think in reconstruction, you got to have the humility to realize you can't build by yourself. And I thought what you said earlier was great. You can't do it solo. Reconstruction projects solo are awful. There's going to be a fatal flaw in what you do. If you don't have like, you know, good people in there doing that. Yeah. And every, every generation has had to tear down something that they didn't build. Mm -hmm. And then they are also left with the responsibility of building something new. Absolutely. I mean, like, here's the truth about it. We live in the wake of, you know, a hundred something years ago a little bit over hundred some years ago that people were brought here, not on their own will to work for free and to be put in harsh conditions, their identities to be stripped. And, and until like, I mean, my father who's still alive drank from different sinks or from different water fountains, like he's still alive. Right. The pro- the reason why I say that is that we live in the wake of other uh, of other people and their decisions, but we have a responsibility. What you're saying, you have a responsibility though to fix it, because here's what's going to happen: we're going to build some crappy, and our grandkids and great grandkids they're going to have to fix it. And so I think that's that's how humanity. That's what you have to do. You do have to many times ride the wave, the good things that were built for you, but also you have to fix the things. And I think what, you know, going back to, I think what our country did and what parents did, and it was, they wanted to give their kids a better life, but what they didn't do was to, it became a whole thing of consumption and now the exploitation of it. They didn't teach people the idea of man of moderation. It was just like, oh, great, go do this, da, da, da. Like, you know, I mean, I don't have to work really hard with my daughter. The, the whole wave right now of like young girls going to Sephora is just unbelievable. Like, you know what I mean? I'm like, like, I mean, you go up in the Sephora and you're like, why are there just, there are more 12 year olds in Sephora than there are grown women, right? Shout out to Sephora. They got good, good cologne in there too. So your boy, <laughs> so when she wants to go out slide a little bit to see if I can pick me up a you scent. You let her get there. that drunk elephant while you're over here getting the Prada cologne. That's, I'm not, I'm not, not Prada, Valentino, new joint. All right. Anyway, but here's what I would say is that, um, but you know, like, but with her, it's like, she'll go in there and she's like, oh, she sees this, she sees this. And she saw this YouTube person say this, I have to have it in moderation for her because I'm like, no, 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 no. Like, this is what you have. You have this, you know, she's fortunate that she has that there's access. And I don't want to hold that. Listen, my, I tell people my father, like didn't come from anything. My father built, so I now am in a place where I can actually help my children to experience some things that, that, that I couldn't experience. And so the thing is, like, I want them to do that, but I want them to understand in moderation what that looks like and what that means and understand where it comes from. So I'm spending a lot more time with my children to understand, like, hey, there are limits. Like, we've been having this conversation lately. Like, so, you know, I'm like, hey, there are limits, and here's why there are limits. Because if I don't teach them that, then, you know, they're going to get out there and just go crazy. And so I just think we have a responsibility to actually help people to develop them. And and one of the biggest things of why, you know, I was having this conversation with somebody, and this is kind of changing directions with somebody this uh, this weekend, was like, and they were asking why I care so much about, like, the next generation. And it's because someone cared about me. That I'm here today because someone cared about me. I'm here today because there were a few business people who didn't look like me um, who were willing to take a chance on me. They were willing to put their name out there for me. They were willing to call some people on my behalf to help me in my first business I started. And, And by they did that, it allowed me to start something. And that's created a lot more jobs and opportunities for other people. So for me, I'm like, man, that is my life right now. My life and my job is to help make sure the generation that's coming up, that they're better. 
And then, you know what? And that's it. I mean, when I'm at this point, it's about how am I helping the next generation be better to give them what they need? And some of that's really hard for me because what I have to tell them is that, yeah, I got to deal with their toughness. I got to deal with their resilience, but I don't want to crush them in that. I want to encourage them. Oh, no, like your emotions, your feelings, all things are great. But there's a level of toughness. And what you guys have learned about emotions a lot is not okay. Like you guys haven't learned well how to get better and heal. You've learned how to identify the problem, but you haven't learned well how to fix and heal the problem. And so that's one of the things I feel like is part of the process. It's kind of, I just don't want to deconstruct like your generation. I actually wanted to, what are some bad things about it? How do we help reconstruct and build so that you guys can flourish at a greater measure? Sweet. Well, hey, guys, I hope today was helpful. Hey, do me a favor. Make sure that well, if it's on YouTube, uh, if it's uh, if you want to uh, drop over on Instagram, wherever, TikTok, let us know who are some creators. I mean, it could be somebody within your community. It could be somebody from a national platform, but people you know who are actually creating and let us know what they're creating. Why is this someone you're willing to post out there? Again, my challenge to you is this. When you hear things or we see things, it can become very overwhelming for us to, to figure out where do I start? I always say you start with what you have in your hands, the world that you're in. So it may mean starting in your home. It may mean starting man, at your job. You may see a problem at your job that people just always complain about. It could be a simple thing as like the snack corner not being organized, which that's something here. <laughs> but the snack corner not being organized. So here's what you could do. Maybe that's your one thing to go create. Instead of complaining about the snack corner, go out there and create a system to make the snack corner better. Until next time, keep writing new rules. <laughs>